Hello, Kisan. Thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. So um, I had to hit record straight away because I trying to do this kind of pre-interview questions. And I feel like I need to record everything you're saying um, for the listeners uh, because I don't know a lot about the space you've been operating in for a long time, the mergers and acquisition space. So um, I, I can look at your LinkedIn and say you are the CEO and founder of MA Science and also Deal Room, which is like a SaaS in the M&A space. So definitely want to talk about those two things. But maybe as an overview, um, you know, what, what has been your life work? What are you, what are you famous for? Yeah, I'm uh, happy to kick that off. I started with a career in M&A advisory, working mainly with private entities, buy side, sell side, with a focus in hospitality, a lot of hotel chains. And then also kind of small financial institutions was the other area of focus of mine. And pretty typical founder story. I we work in the industry long enough. You're familiar with the pain points and challenges. And you start seeing emerging trends in the tech sector and start getting ideas, which I noticed software engineers would use these really cool project management tools to manage developing software and thought, why not for M&A? And uh, that led to starting a company called Deal Room in 2012. That was project management for M&A. And that, that's evolved into a full-on lifecycle management product. And we'll get a little bit into that. And I was really fortunate, again, where about a little over five years ago, a friend in marketing was like, hey, man, you should do a podcast. And I was like, what the hell is a podcast? And he, he's like, don't worry about it. It's the next big thing. You just got to do one. And back then, there was only about four or five podcasts covering M&A. Today there's over 50 and we've done really well. Um, we had a lot of fun hosting of the podcasts we have and we repurpose a lot of that content. And today I've published over 350 pieces of content, blog posts, eBooks, just published our second book, working on a third one. And that evolved during COVID into doing virtual events where we run these summits about three to four times a year and they're fun. Um, we then started an online school for M&A. So we've sort of combined not only the technology component, but also the, the education and best practice, which is probably the, the underpinning problem in our industry is that it lacks standardization around those best practices. If you look at all these companies, they have their own way of thinking and, and approaching M&A. Uh, so with the, the idea of the platform uh, or using a podcast as a platform was, can we do a series of quantitative interviews and identify what are the trends, patterns, and the proven techniques that we can find in the industry and start documenting it, make it into resources that other practitioners can leverage? Okay, so I definitely need to demystify some of this. Uh, and, and like we talked about off air, it's helpful that I've not spent really much time in the M&A world. I can think really to what is my exposure and probably a lot of the listeners' exposure is you see – you know, a news piece like I'm thinking right now, the most recent one was um, there's like the the rail company. I, remember, I think it's the Kansas City Rail or something is being acquired by one of the Canadian rail companies. And, you know, it's a it's an acquisition of one big train company of another train company. And as a, a, a normal person, you hear that you think, OK, it's they're going to combine forces and become one big company. One is probably bigger than the other. And they're just going to have a larger customer base service more of the country. And that to me, I understand sort of the purpose, but I feel like behind the scenes, there's so much more going on. Um, before you answer that question, though, I actually would like to step back in time because as far as I know, and maybe this was or was not the case for you. I don't remember any kid when, you know, mom and dad asked them, what do you want to do when you grow up? And they say, I want to be an m and A. I want to be in mergers and acquisitions. So um, how did you even get exposed? <laughs> like, what was the, what did you do growing up initially? You know, my dad would say otherwise. He said, I remember when you're 10 years old and you would always draw these pictures of cars and you would make it into a little book and here's these cars with like lasers and rocket boosters and you'd always put prices in the millions and billions and uh <laughs> so I, I don't know i was always drawn in by big numbers and i think running a practice was great when you run a boutique practice you run into that glass ceiling where these large what does that mean though when you say running a practice what does that actually mean advising you're advising organizations on their m a activity whether they're buying or selling and it's it's a it's a fun business. It, the challenge I had with it was the two part. One is you get a chance at the hundred million dollar transaction, and you wouldn't get it. It always go to a brand name firm, 
Uh, and then the other thing was you're living deal by deal. Like you really live deal by deal. That first year we had the recession back in 06, 07, took a big hit. That was tough. That was nerve wracking. And you're, hey, do I stay on path and hope that it gets better next year? Or do I pivot and try something else and different? And that's what ultimately what I did, started shifting towards the technology space. Is this transatlantic investments and advisory? Is that your initial? Yep. M and A. That was firm? the first practice okay. I ran for almost ten years. Okay, so let me ask the basic questions around that, which should be that time of your life as well. So the purpose of your company at the time, there'd be one company thinking about acquiring another, and essentially they need consultation on the nuts and bolts of how to do that: the financing, the combination of staff, leadership. Uh, is that, and then you come in with the expertise to advise them on how to structure that, how to get financing. Is that kind of roughly speaking? Yeah, if you, if you look at a, a typical private company, when you look at the fundraising part of it, um, when you look at that, when they, if they sell and if they acquire other businesses, they're pretty infrequent events that happen. They don't really develop this expertise in those areas. They're really focused on the core business that they have. As an advisor, you're able to assist and bring this experience and expertise in those areas. I'd say most of M&A is focused on sell side. Sell side tends to be the more lucrative part. So you get the traditional investment banking model of to kind of take a company, run an auction process, get the highest price for it, and sell the business. Um, I, I personally love doing the buy side work. I had so much fun out going out, hunting for deals. That part I really thrived off of, but in the money's on the sell side. Why is that? Just because you're taking a cut of the final sale price it, of the it business? Is. You get a cut of the business, but it's, if you have something for sale, it's almost like inevitably it's going to sell at some point in time. Somebody's going to buy it. It may take a month. It may take a year. Somebody will eventually buy it and you'll get your fees on it. On the buy side, you could, you need to be careful about who you're working with. You could be working with a buyer that may seem like a serious buyer, but they may never buy anything. They may keep pass, 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 and a lot of frustration. And you know, uh, if you do get a, a retainer on the buy side, it's usually not much either way on buy or sell side. But on the sell side, you'll you'll typically get your deal done. Okay, so uh, forgive me for being really basic here, but the day you decided to launch Transatlantic Investments and Advisory. How does that even happen? Like, do you have deals in the pipeline because you know certain people who want to sell their company? Like, what is the trigger point? And then, like, why do you even believe, you know, you can enter? Because I feel like, like you said before, there's a lot of big fish in M&A. And, like, why choose someone who's just come along and saying, I could sell your company versus go to a big established player and is that more to do with the size of the company too like small companies don't qualify for the bigger players so they need to look for more boutique um firms i'm kind of guessing here but is yeah that, is that absolutely right? I, I came from a unique spot i didn't follow a traditional path where you often would get into investment banking start as a, an analyst and work your way up the ranks I came from a real estate background where I essentially failed at selling houses and found my way into this tiny little M&A advisory shop that somehow figured out how to generate a lot of inbound interest. And they had primar primarily various Indians that were responding to these, these uh, posts that they put online. And they hired me as this young Indian kid to go deal with these Indian prospects and go tell them some <laughs> small businesses. And I, I did. I started doing it and had tra I had fun because I liked I liked P and Ls. I liked the numbers. I liked building a story around. Here's an opportunity. Here's how we can reduce expenses. Here's how we can grow revenues. And uh, I did well doing it, but realized the firm itself had some faults where they didn't have a clear strategy in the where they're trying to build their expertise in. And that's where I decided a year after into it to start a practice with a focus in specific verticals. And that led to starting our, our own firm. And it's it's tough. It's definitely hard to get out there and, and start something new. So never forget it. I I, I, I can imagine. I, I think the, the other part, too, when you think about the, the size of the firm and how we got the traction, there's a little bit of understanding the model from experience at a firm, but ultimately came down to grit. I think just being really young, I was in my early 20s, 
not being afraid to lose anything, knock on doors, and show people how willing I was to take chance, to put in the best effort I can, be extremely responsive, and it worked. It it got folks to say, "All right, I'll give you give you a shot here," and ended up building off of it, and made some success happen. Um, when we when you would, would you mind? Um, sorry, oh, yeah. Ethan, I was going to ask. Did, would you, can you share like your first ever deal? Like what yeah. what was the company? I'm not if you're allowed to disclose that. I know. What, what did you, you know, so long ago? And I'm friends with the, the okay. guy now. So okay, you know, I started this practice in downtown Chicago, and I, I remember. <laughs> Renting this office and the landlord didn't even know what to do with me because, or the, the representative, because I'm asking for a month to month lease. And I, I'm like, I just want to try this out, see what happens. And I ended up talking to the owner of the property, worked out a deal, got this little office going, and ran out of capital. I, I thought, hey, I had 10 grand, was enough working capital. I was fortunate enough, my dad lent me 30K just to, to keep things going. And uh, I thought I was I was done because he's like, that's all. I'm not going to l- lend you any more money. I don't really believe in what you're doing here. <laughs> uh, I got so lucky that I came across a 363 asset sale of a company called More Oil out of Indiana. And they had a small portfolio of little gas stations, five or six of them, that they were liquidating through a bank process. And I got to represent these assets and go through and sell them. And the first one I remember selling was a tiny little, and I, I remember this deal was such a good deal that I, I kept running or trying to ask family members. A lot of the family members are in these different type of retail businesses and nobody wanted to go out there. Nobody, they're like, oh, it's too far, too far away from Chicago. <laughs> and I ended up finding this guy online who, um, that's all he did. He'd buy a business, turn it around and flip it, sell it, and go travel somewhere else, do the same thing. And uh, that's uh, ended up selling it to him or I remember the business the we had a net two hundred and ten thousand. I sold it to him for two hundred and forty thousand. And then three months later I sold the same business again for five hundred and fifty thousand. So it was I mean I'm okay. watching this guy make about three hundred thousand dollars in three months. And that <laughs> yeah. you know, we we got decent fees to start building out the, the practice and, and pick things up from there. But that um do, do you mind sharing what the fee is for like a deal like that? Is it enough to survive a year, a month? Uh... You know, the, the small deals, and we talked a little about the size fit with firms. These small deals, it, it, it really varies. You can do up to 10% on them. You know, I gave you like 240 I charged 30000 then I sold again for 550 and kept fifty k. So those small deals, you, you can get up to, to 10%. And I think when you get over a million, it starts tapering down. They'll, they'll use these different models like the Lehman formula or whatever you negotiate if you're savvy. Uh, uh, you know, advisor. Um, I, I think, though, when you do look at the size of deals, there is a bit of a nature of fit to it. You don't want to be, you don't want to be a mid-sized company going to Goldman Sachs because you're you're just not going to get the attention that you would with a mid-level bank. That's so. There there is some some truth to right sizing when you are working with these different, uh, be it like a boutique M and A shop or an investment bank. Um, you, I think that that's important to consider. I think a lot of people will get okay. overly drawn into the names, but you start going to the city, the the JPMs. And they they may bank you because a lot of them are broadening up and creating a middle market focus. But um, I would really pay attention to the team you're working with and make sure that's an area that they're going to prioritize uh, for them and it's not something that's okay. left up to the side and who knows what happens. <laughs> Do you mind just closing the loop? Because this really helps explain the the full process. So, if you're getting ten percent to sell this small gas station, you know, out in a smaller area, and then sell it again when the the, the new owner wants to sell it, what do you actually do for that ten percent? Like, what is the you bring to the table? That um, is it? A, yeah, a yeah, good thing is is marketing. One part I think a lot of people don't realize when you go sell your business, there's a ton of prep involved. And especially if you're going out to market, you may be dealing with two types, unsophisticated and sophisticated buyers. Sophisticated buyers are ones that may be the right buyers, that they're the ones that are going to pay the best price. And you need to be really prepared because they're going to do a very formal diligence process and they're going to have expectations to see things. They want to see clean books. They want to really be able to have clear answers on the things that they look for when they identify risk in their deals. The better you clean your house and have it ready to go, 
better, smoother and better the process is going to go. Otherwise, you're going to keep opening up these little red flags that are going to require clarification, and it's going to slow down your process and, and just make it uh, frustrating and more headaches than you need. So really important to have somebody that can help you prepare your business for that process. And then going through the marketing phase, if you have somebody that's worked in the industry for selling hotels, and that was one I worked in, and understand who are the key players, given the size of the deal, I know I can make a quick list of here's my top 10 that I would go to. And then I'll blow that out and maybe find an additional 40 to make it 50 and say, okay, I'm going to run a very comprehensive process. Um, these are the people I would go out to. And with those kind of assets too, you can be a little more public and maybe run a marketing process that, that's pretty broad. Uh, and then you'll spend the time to filter out those potential buyers and qualify them. Um, and then once you go through that process and come to some terms and have an LOI signed, then a formal diligence process happens or conformatory diligence. And that, that gets pretty intensive. And, and when you think about the advisor's role, there's one helping to filter the buyers, helping the client understand the differences between the buyer. It may not just strictly be go with the highest price. You know, nowadays, especially sellers, are very invested with the organization they built and they want to see it continue and they want to see the team be in a good place. So they want to make sure that things will be aligned for them as well. And that might not be the highest price. You know, you may have a company with mm. the culture is aligned better and there, there's going to be a better future. Or they're planning to preserve the product where the other may, Hey, we're going to just destroy this and get rid of a competitor. You know, there's different views and understanding what that post close with the strategies of the buyer is an important factor. And that's, something with an advisor can help you with some of the considerations. And then the diligence I think is really important because that process is so intensive. And it, it, if you can imagine getting hundreds of questions and a lot of follow-up questions, so you get a bunch of requests for documentation, which if you did your housekeeping, it'll won't be as bad as it could be. And then the, you'll get additional follow-up questions like, Hey, maybe you had this lawsuit five years ago. Like we want to know there's no little things that are going to creep back from that. Let, let, let's have yeah. some clarification questions. That advisor will help with that because otherwise that diligence process ends up becoming so distracting for your management team that it could potentially affect the performance of the business while you're transacting, which would be a bad thing. You don't want to be doing a deal and right. all of a sudden you missed your quarterly goals or expectations and then it raises more concerns with that buyer. So helping to minimize the distractions so the management team can stay focused on operating the business is another key component that a, a, a seller provides or advisor provides his value. Okay. That's interesting. I, I, you're making me think back a previous guest on my show, um, Baird Hall, he sold a company called wave and he talked about how they made the mistake him and his co-founders of basically selling it themselves and, and realizing, Oh my God, there's just so many documents they had to get created and signed, you know, the legal processing. And they were like, we should have used a broker. So he used that term like a broker to broker the, or a selling agent. And it's funny, like M and a, it sounds more like this wall street term that you hear about, you know, in, 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 uh, online and in, in finance papers and websites and so on, where, I grew up in this world of, you know, you sell a website, it's not selling a business, it's simpler transactions. So I like that they're really the same thing, ultimately, just at bigger scales. Um, I'd love to talk about that in terms of the almost 10 years you were running your own practice. Um, maybe two questions, total deal volume, and is there like, you remember your, your biggest deal and, and what, what that was like? We had a lot of mist on the bigger deals. I feel like I had a handful of 100 million plus opportunities and, and really missed them all. Um, the bigger deals that we did were actually finance projects that we were refinancing hotel assets in the 50, 60 million dollar range. Those are probably the bigger ones. Okay. Uh, I think you had a good point in the terminology too. When you hear broker, I think of business brokers as the mom and pop shops. If you think of where I started with those little convenience stores, gas station type of deals. And then when you start moving past 10 million, now you fall in this M&A advisory category, which mm. is typically still unlicensed. You're, you know, maybe you got registered you know, in Illinois, you register with the state and, and do, do something there. But until you get to a level as an investment bank, you're registered with FINRA. So I, I would say those might be the, the buckets to distinguish. 
that, hey, if it's a really okay. small transaction, there's a whole pool of business brokers out there. But then you move into the M&A advisory when you start getting to this this mid market, you know that that ten to two hundred million, uh, then above two hundred million, you're you're probably working with a licensed investment bank. Okay, that's really interesting, useful. All right, so um, that example of like your biggest deal, which is more of a refinance, are you just going to private equity where a company is buying a part of the company to help them finance? Like what does a refinance actually look like? We were doing it through large banks where Credit Suisse was a big bank okay. I would work with to run those kind of deals with, and then local banks as well. Um, so that, yeah, that was an interesting thing I found out was working with the hotel assets, they fall kind of hybrid between business and real estate asset. So it's, hmm. um, and there's pretty lucrative just going through and refinancing them, picking up like half a point just for putting those deals together. Uh, and then the, if you were working with real estate developers, then you can do a lot of things. I think we did a hotel deal where we did the acquisition for about 17, 18 million. Then you pull construction loans out with that and sort of package the, the finance with it as well. Um, so yeah, and then turn around and sell it a year later. Hmm. Yeah, because that starts the relationship, right? You help them with the financing, and then when it's time to sell, they come come back to you as well, or, or time to buy. Um, okay, I'd love to maybe move your story forward, um, Kisan. Uh, so you, like you said, it was a bit of a the kind of business model where it's you're always looking for a deal, so it maybe doesn't feel super comfortable in terms of stability. And like, and then you mentioned there was like the GFC, which really impacted things for you. Uh, what led you to transitioning? Or, and, and and correct me if I'm wrong here. Did you literally quit or leave or sell your own firm and start something completely new, or or did you kind of start it in parallel, like a side hustle, SaaS, while yeah. you're still running your own firm? Or? It was. I winded it down slowly, and during the recession, where I had us, I think in our peak we had about five people. It was a really small firm. We did a good job, though. People always thought we were a much bigger firm than we actually were. It just it did, we're very efficient, handled a good volume of transactions, and then um, just wound wanted it, wanted it down, wound it down the office, and basically operated as a sole practitioner during the recession because there really wasn't deals going on. Um, probably gotten in, involved with a few liquidations that were a result of the recession, and I started dabbling around with the tech at the same time. I started getting involved with the, a Mark Tech startup that didn't ultimately pan out, um, but it, it led me to understand this whole ecosystem of the software space and the tools that these engineers used. Uh, then started the company Deal Room in 2012, but that was tough. That was a lot of like, a lot of lessons learned the hard way. And I think a lot of people get startup ideas, Yaro. You, you know this space as well. Yeah. And you, I, yeah. you probably same with me. You get the phone call. Here's someone's friend that wants to do a startup, and I think I got one this weekend actually. Uh, and you're trying to be as nice as possible to tell them how brutally hard it actually is. <laughs> and that, like, you know, think of a restaurant, like a restaurant, you know, you, you got to know how to make a great product. You, you got to have a lot of certain things that go right, where you got to have a good location. You got to have a good, a good structure, property, uh, good ambiance, great menu, structured, good cooks, things to make a good meal. Uh, so you got like 10 things that really got to go right. But and the thing is like with, the, with that kind of business is really visible. Like you can see pretty clear what's going good and what's going not. Where right. tech, it's the same in terms of having things go right. You, you got to pay attention to these pieces, but a lot of them you can't really see. So you're, you're very much dependent on if you're not a technical founder and you're relying on mm. developers to write, you know, good code and functioning code and things like that. It's a really different dynamic, and there's a lot more pieces involved with it. Um, I, I don't know. It, it's And that's the thing. I think ultimately you got to realize there's a competency of building a great product at the end of the day that you need to make your goal. You can make crappy software, and nobody's going to buy it, or you can make great software. Do you understand that competency it takes to actually build great software? Uh, that's the one thing I didn't realize. I, I sort of mm. assumed like a consulting practice. You can kind of get it going and, and iterate on it and figure out these pieces as you go. Um, software is a little different. <laughs> it's just, you, mm. uh, so th there was a lot of, um, hard lessons learned that I, I think looking back at it, it, it seems obvious now, but, um, that was definitely some struggles in the beginning. 
Well, I mean, t- take us through it. So I'd love to know, you have this idea, you're, you're winding down your actual boutique firm, uh, deal flow is not so good, GFC is happening. But then you're also thinking, I now have spent a decade in this space, I see the need for a software solution to something that goes on within M&A. I need to go hire a developer to, vil- to build an MB- MVP. Is that kind of your thinking at the time? Yes. You have an idea. You want to hire developers. I think there's a couple things. One, you start getting obsessed with wanting to build things right the first time. And the other thing, the feature creep, you have this idea and you start thinking about like all these possible things that your user would possibly want. And you end up with this giant outline of functionality that, uh, so you sort of naturally go the opposite of an MVP and building a, a prototype to just to validate your business model. Yeah. But I think one is what was, sorry, I was just going to ask what, with an example, what was your initial idea? Like what was your, your, I, I had a vision for end to end management of M and a that was, and, and I what, ended up starting with, what does that mean? Well, if you look at like, a deal, you go through the phases of, and I got to flip it around because back then we, we were very focused on the sell side today. We were very focused on buy side. Uh, so then it's like, hey, you got to go through the steps to prepare a company, take it out to market, find potential buyers for it, manage a diligence process, and then give them a handoff of all that information so they can run with it and go through their integration process. Um, that that was the early thinking in, in what we wanted to build. And, and there's just a lot. There's a lot. There was a whole marketplace model to connect buyers and sellers. That's where we thought, hey, let's start off with the beginning part and start building the environment to connect buyers and sellers. But I think that the thing is you don't realize, the thing we didn't realize was there are a lot of different problems that we're trying to solve all at once. And you need to solve one thing at a time and solve it really, really well and validate you solve it well, then figure out how you can scale that solution out to others, yeah. then look at solving the next problem. Uh, and we, when we started it too, there was a lot of assumptions that we had from our prior experience that we did these smaller transactions that we thought would apply well to the middle market. That was a larger size transactions that weren't true. There were assumptions that were dead wrong and we paid for it. And we started the launch this product, started marketing it as a marketplace, acquired about 1,300 different users and 200 deals listed and realized we built a sophisticated dumpster for deals because they were all just <laughs> stuff that nobody in the right mind would invest in. And then, okay. Then we, Are you talking kind of like a, a Flippa? I don't know if you know Flippa, it, the online marketplace for websites. It was sort of like, like that? Yeah, but we didn't have a, a digital focus. It was all kinds of businesses. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think what where that was the realization that we need to go back to the drawing board. I was fortunate enough to have a good friend to walk me through and elaborate. Hey, think of the lean startup model, like really mm. focus on the problem you're solving, go through a series of these customer development interviews, validate the problem you're solving, then validate the solution and developing. And we did that. We just took a step back, started doing, I think we did our goal is to do about 40 of these interviews really understand different cohorts of potential customers and what their pain points are and validate them. And there's, uh, there's both like the science and art to it because a lot of people tell you what you want to hear and can you design your question? Mm-hmm. You, you want to hear what you want to hear too. So mm-hmm. can you design your questions to be as unbiased as possible and be very objective when you conduct that, that type of interview? Then we did these interviews and realized that it's not finding the, the opportunities that people have a problem with is the management side. We really started focusing on management, modeled out solutions. I know people do wireframes, but I don't feel like the general public doesn't understand wireframes really well. So I, I, I always encourage go on Upwork or whatever platform and either find somebody overseas or find a student, have them do some basic mock-ups so you can present it and do those same kind of interviews on the solution, validate the solution. What I later learned is while you're validating the solution, you should also validate your go-to-market. Start understanding where are these channels, how are they going to buy your product and what's that going to look like? Because again, we fell back on assumptions and went to market the same way our competitors did, which is a terrible mm-hmm. thing to do. That was not a good idea at all. They have a totally different product, different business model that justified them doing the way, sold, selling the way they did with 
uh, field refs and unlimited expense cards and things of that sort. Okay. Could you, could you make that tangible? So when you took a step back, you started doing both problem research and go to market research. What did you then identify as the problem and how did you go to market with that, that first version that I feel like you're getting to the point where you've, you actually got something that got some traction. Yeah, the, the first big thing we really lasered in on was the diligence process, that when buyers and sellers go back and forth, the buyer has a lot of documents they need to review, and they have a lot of follow-up clarification questions that come after. In the current state, the customers were, or the customers in this case, were using Excel trackers. They're using an Excel sheet and build a tracker to manage all this request for information and, and uh, questions. And it got tedious quickly because you're batching everything. It could, this could be hundreds, over a thousand items, depending on the deal size. Then you have follow-up questions that go on the same tracker. And now you're having a discussion on an Excel sheet that's not very clean at all. Uh, found it very to be a problematic pain point for these customers that's where we really focused on for a solution. And the idea was, hey, we see these project management tools the software engineers use. Why don't we do something like that? Why don't we take this data security platform, the virtual data room that was commonly used in the industry to exchange the documents? And the difference between a data room and your typical Dropbox, some additional security features, they'll have automated watermarking. So your documents can be watermarked if somebody sends it out to the wrong person. You know who leaked the document out. It'll have their login, mm -hmm. time they accessed it, and everything. They'll also, you can put very, very granular permissions in the data room environment. So maybe I want to lock everything down so it's view only, but there's this Excel model that I'm going to give you access to download and tinker with offline. So we have very granular permissions. And then audit trails, very detailed audit trail on everything that's been touched in, in the whole uh, data room. So the idea is that that was standard in the industry. People always use these data rooms. Why don't we just put the to-do list on top of the data room to manage all that back and forth? And now you can do it in a real-time environment, just like the project management tools, and essentially bring workflow to the industry. And that uh, that was the first first thing we did. But it was still tough. I think with the nature of the industry and the deals that we're doing, people don't trust the new new kids on the block with uh, a solution. <laughs> They're like, hey. We're doing a $100 million deal here. Why, why should we use this brand new product nobody's ever heard of? What will our client right. think? I think bankers tend to be conservative. It was really, really tough. A lot of brute force knocking on doors, hitting people on on uh, LinkedIn just constantly. Knock, knock, knock. I was fortunate I had a bank, uh, Felix, Felix Donichu from Elmcore Group, just gave me a shot and said, hey, I got a client. They're going to go on a Toronto exchange, IPO work. Why don't you, you know, let me get you this deal, help you get going. I did. And then from there, it picked up. We started working with Allstate and some other companies, and, and things started picking up. Um, I, I think there, that part was, it was, it was tough too, because once we started getting the live deals, then you realize that, hey, you built this product, but it's not really built for scale. So, and that's the thing, you know, we were going through all these iterations with the prototype mindset, but now we had to shift to how do we rebuild a product for scale? Uh, what Was it a venture-backed company? Like, was did you get funding for Deal Room or was it uh, Bootstrap? Bootstrap. Bootstrap. Okay, so you're pouring in all your, your previous profit from your boutique agency into the hope of a SaaS software program taking off, basically, that, that sort of hardcore entrepreneur mentality. It was, it was hard. It was all really tough doing it that way. Uh, I think at the time we originally looked at raising some capital, but Chicago wasn't a super, it's not like a Bay Area where people take bets and take chances on you. They want to see a significant amount of traction. So the, the only term sheet we got offered was terrible. We're like, well, I might as well just keep investing more money into it. Um, okay. So it's, yeah. Well, yeah, take us forward with the, the deal room story. It's, it's 10 years later. You're still like uh, running the company, I believe I, if I'm CEO and founder, according to LinkedIn, still up and running. So um, what was the like the process of scaling it? And it sounds like the initial door knocking led to your first client, which means you've got social proof to help get the second client. And I can imagine maybe word of mouth starts to kick in and that starts spreading the word too. But 
like at what point did you feel, okay, we're okay now. This is a, a functioning, profitable business. Yeah, I feel like everything you think would be a driver to drive it forward, like what you mentioned, didn't happen. <laughs> like word of mouth okay. wasn't the thing. And, and now it happens when you, you hit a significant scale, but I wouldn't bet on that. I think we, we thought that there was going to be some inherent vi- virality with the product because when you host a project room, you'll end up inviting 100 plus users into that environment. We assume that, hey, if these users come in, then they're in turn going to get a good experience and want to use the tool for one of their other projects. That happens, but it didn't happen like the way we thought it would. There wasn't, that wasn't a natural growth through that channel. Um, we, well, one big difference is we realized the banks weren't our early adopters. They we're spending all this time, energy trying to sell them, but the corporates were actually our early adopters. They were much easier to sell mm. to. They were incentivized to create value and improve what they were doing, drive efficiency, where banks often weren't. There was a big disconnect between the leadership and the folks that actually used our product. And the folks that used our product, they didn't care about improving the process. They were there in for a short ride. They know at the end of the year they're going to quit and go work on the buy side. So uh, that way they don't care. They're just going to do it the way they do and get it done and get out. Uh, and then plus the competitors were buying them all kinds of treats. They're taking them out, buying them ball game tickets and all these perks. So you're competing wow. with that. And at the end of the day, that, that's what won the hearts of these junior bankers. Uh, when we work with the corporates, they're sophisticated. They're all about creating value and demonstrating that to the seniors that that's what they're doing and, and framing themselves to get promoted. Uh, and to align yourself with that, that's, that's a good thing. So, the, you know, we kept going along pretty reasonable pace i think one other big challenge you came across was your distribution model i I feel like you go through this whole heartache and struggles of building a product getting market fit then realizing like you need to rebuild everything at that time we had to rebuild our our tech team to build for scale that's okay now we're now we just got to sell the thing and Mm -hmm. realize that that's actually harder than building the product and all that perspiration you just went through you got to do double down on it and we started hiring sales reps. We didn't have a marketing function. They struggled, ended up, only one of them survived. Uh, she's heading our client success team now, Julia. But we ended up making some false start there. That was expensive. Then we shifted focus, built the marketing function, which I think that going back, I would definitely do that. In fact, Yaro, if I were to start a tech company today, I would make, Clearly, part of the strategy is to build a media company within the tech company because that's mm-hmm. what's created our, all our tailwind today is when we started podcasting, expanding, creating all these series of contents, collaborating with subject matter experts, really building it. That, that's a really helped a lot. But um, So we built a marketing function. We've been doing that the last four years. That's made a huge difference. We've got tons of inbound leads. Sales reps love inbound leads. Uh, and then when they yeah. reach out, people have heard of us more often than not. We've got tons of collateral, tons of resources, events to invite them to, all these things that marketing supports. Um, and the, those efforts are, everything's becoming more digital. So the interactions you get are tend to be more through the marketing channels first than the, the sales channel. I love the way you put that, uh, build a, a media company within your startup. Uh, I, I call it content marketing. I come from a, a blogging and a podcasting background. So it's natural for me to see content and media as the way to reach people, especially at, at low costs. And I mean, I, I say low cost as a cost to create the content, but then ideally it sits out there and, and keeps bringing in value. And even my own company right now, I, I run a, an email management executive assistant company called Inbox Done. And our main marketing channel is, yeah, it's a, a kind of like an in-house media company. We've got copywriters. I'm somewhat doing it right now, being on podcasts. Uh, I even talk about my company as a sponsor for this show. So it's all kind of interrelated. Yeah, we do the same. Take me, um, take me back to the, the decision you made. So you said it was about four years ago you realized you needed to start producing support, education, and, and content. We just needed How marketing. Did you start that? <laughs> we didn't have marketing. You're like, we needed marketing. I did the, the, a lot of the fabled mistakes. I hired the hotshot CMO with the Apple Motorola background and was the failed hire. Then I ended up bringing somebody mid-level, about five years of experience coming out of an agency, was able to participate as an individual contributor, 
started creating social media. I just kind of sat back like, okay, let's see what that does. And then (laughs) she started creating a blog and getting that going and then started building out some contract writers. And now she runs a function, whole function. We got more than 10 people in marketing alone for a company that's just passing 30 headcount. Nice. Okay. So did it like, did you notice an impact? I know content social in particular is not known for an instant result. So how did it sort of play out? Like year one was not so good or, uh, it, it, you know, the, it was interesting because it was very much an SEO first approach, which isn't common. Okay. And, and that was partly because of the, the budget you know, we didn't have venture money where you typically would spend for a lot of paid ads initially to yeah. try to validate and prove your model quick as you can. And then you build out the SEO once you have that dialed in and we just played long on SEO, which looking back at it was probably a really good decision because now we, we do extremely well there leads boy back then we didn't we'd have a thousand visits to the mo- website a month and maybe we got one lead a month now <laughs> i we get a lot i think uh, we captured like nine thousand contacts just this last quarter um, oh wow yeah and then i don't we got a lot of we got a lot of trials coming in demo requests well into the hundreds um so there, yeah there there is a lot a lot to, to to be said of the value that it's created with the marketing function so, so what are you doing with this content? Are you teaching people the ins and outs of M&A? Yeah, uh, it's all educational. I, if we step back, when we think about our journey, working with banks, starting working with corporates, and spending the time with that same model of solution selling, like, let me understand your pain points. Let me introduce a solution but, and underpin it with a good business case on why the solution is going to create value. We quickly realized all these companies, it wasn't the same story we can bring to one another. They all had a unique way of looking at M&A and approaching M&A. And the bigger problem in the industry was the industry itself. It operated in a silo and lacked standardization and best practices. And that was part of the idea with doing a podcast was can we use it as a platform to enable practitioners to share their lessons learned and allow us to identify what are some of these proven techniques that we can then capture, document, and share with the industry and that, that's what it's able to really help us. So I, I think podcasting and these tools out there is good, but if you can build it with a mission, and that, that was our goal, was to enable practitioners to share listen, lessons learned, um, but now it's, it's really evolved to providing the industry with these educational resources um, that's based off of evidence. Mm-hmm. Nice. So you use a bit of research, some data, and it sounds like you're slicing it up for the different sort of stories in the head of your potential clients as well. So like niche within niche marketing um, is the best place to check all that out is just go to dealroom.co and, and look at your content or we're, is it so we're is dealroom.net. That... There's actually a dealroom.co, okay. which we're good. Oh. We're good friends with them. They're a European based company that does okay. data for startups. And they, they, I mean, they've probably grown beyond that. Um, but they're okay. Amsterdam based company We're our main product line is dealroom.net. Okay, and then we, here I am doing all this crunch-based research on your European counterpart then. So. Yeah, no, you're, you're, it happens all the time, but we, yeah. mascience.com, so M&A Science, that's becoming our umbrella brand. It's, it's interesting. Right. I, I wish we tied it together earlier, so now we operate both brands. But if you look at mascience.com, you'll see we have several product lines all within that, that line. Uh, and then the podcast obviously drives a good amount of traffic to it. Both of them have so, so just, tons of educational content. We yeah, and them. maybe you can help help us to connect the dots here too. So, how would this work? I'm I'm a, a founder of a company. I'm thinking of selling it. I need like I, I Google um, diligence process for selling my ten million dollar company. Your one of your M and A science articles comes up. I learn about what information I need. And then I also learn about deal room as a platform to manage that diligence uh, workflow. Is that kind of right? Have I just described a typical maybe discovery process? I would say so. Uh, on the sell side, it's pretty, it is straightforward. There are a lot of companies that are represented. So there are advisors that would tend to engage with us and saying, Hey, I got a client I'm working with to sell their business and they would activate our service and help manage it. Um, a lot of our contents focused because we, we ha- do have a focus today with corporate M&A and corporates will sell businesses, but more often than not, they're acquiring businesses. Um, when you acquire a business, there's the whole process of going through sourcing deals that align with your strategy and doing the diligence from the buy side. 
But the integration part is really complex. That if you think about the big problem underpinning, M- the biggest problem with M&A today is the process itself, that we're still driven off of this 20-year-old finance-focused M&A approach, and it doesn't work. It, you end up with a bunch of pissed-off people that quit and take away a bunch of value at the end of the deal, and you've seen it before. Mm-hmm. You've seen the acquisition go bad, change was too abrupt, and it just dismantled the business, created too much disruption. Mm. When we look at that process, when we acquire a business, the integration process is the largest magnitude of change management an organization could possibly go through. You're peeling back an organization in the years and years it's created their process, processes layer by layer and reattaching it to another organization. But trying to do that without pissing people off is uh, <laughs> yeah. extremely difficult. And that, that's where today we talk a lot about building a people-focused M&A process and really keeping them engaged, keeping the leadership from that target company in the loop about what the strategy is for the deal. What does this integration go to look like? In fact, we doing all this diligence on you. How about you do some diligence on us and understand what our organization looks like, how you're going to fit in and be integrated into this organization and what that's going to look like and be part of that journey so we can really work together on this and be aligned around the goals and what the outcomes are going to be versus keeping you in the dark and you're hit up, hit with these surprises and changes and getting the frustration, the, the FUD factor and ultimately leaving to disband the company. So I, um, yeah, there's a long ways to go, but that's the, the big thing we're really, really focused on is improving the integration process. So there's a better people experience. The overall transaction is better, smoother, more efficient. People are happier. Value gets realized a lot faster. Okay. Uh, so I, I'm curious now, Akisan, the, the day in the life, you would have previously been this deal maker guy, right? Running around looking for the buyer or the seller and, and doing all that diligence and relationship building. And, and then you became a, a SaaS startup founder, completely different role, really. I mean, even if it is in the topic that you, you know about, you were trying to digitize uh, a workflow process that you used to do probably very manually. And today it sounds like you're almost you're in charge of a SaaS company, but you're also in charge of a media company. What, what is a day in the life like? What do you work on personally for, for you know, the whole organization? <laughs> That's a good question. It's, um, I, you know, the thing that I really, really love about being SaaS is I never get bored. I think with, with, with M&A, you, can, you tend to stay focused in certain verticals and, and go deep in there. And I, I love meeting people, the conversations. But when you're building a company, and the learning never ends. You start off with a big focus on the technology, keeping up with it, building a team around it, then the marketing function, understand. Marketing never ends. There's so many things you can do, but and it's fun. You can get very creative in that, that part of the business. Uh, now we're very much focused on building out the sales function and creating and understanding, hey, the bigger companies that we work with, the bigger problems they have. Uh, which is a better opportunity for us to be able to solve big problems for large organizations that the outcome ends up being better uh, revenues from that. So now now we're starting to build an enterprise sales team. And so I, th- I think that's the, the big thing is the learning never ends. Um, mm. you, it the sounds day, like the, you are doing a lot of hiring. Are you, is that your day-to-day, just hiring and team? I was going to say, the, in terms of the day-to-day, it bounces around. There's still – I'm doing a lot of podcasts for our stuff um, – working to support the sales team when they need help. I think the the hiring is a big one and it, it does fluctuate. We sort of go through cycles. Like we'll tend not to hire towards the end of the year and early of the year because it, it's either slow or then very competitive in the beginning of the year. Um, so there, there's a little bit of cycles that we try to build around in terms of hiring, but then obviously there's needs that come up and, and you got to respond to it. That does take a lot of time. Uh, I think the one thing that, I struggle with to spend as much time as I should is the client value delivery. That's probably today's big focus is pushing and saying, hey, we've acquired a number of customers, but if I go back, and especially the ones that have been with us for a number of years, you realize that they've been using you for this one or two use case for all these years, but now you've expanded to manage 10, 15 different use cases. So there's so much opportunity to go back and help them whether or not it's directly tied to selling another product and getting more revenue, 
but just even the way they could engage with your existing product and get more value mm. out of it, it'll help keep their um, their uh, LTV or keep their subscription. Stop extended. them from churning as well. Yeah, yeah, reduce the churn exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So I, I think that's the the big thing. It's you know what was the was, I know it's you know roughly like thirty percent. You should be spending your time at least at the minimum with the customers because the opportunity is there. The opportunity is there to understand how you can improve your product, uh, how, how you can actually go to market better, how you can expand on those accounts. But more importantly, at the end of the day, your core competency as an organization is your ability to create value, and if you can expand on that capability the stronger organization you'll be, the more value, value you'll be able to generate for your clients uh, and be able to create that capability across your organization. That's what you ultimately want to do. And if you're constantly on the front end of the deal trying to close deals, you don't really develop that competency that you would when you're actually focused on the value delivery part. So mm. I, I would say that's okay. the, the big takeaway of this year is to really, really focus on value delivery and get good at it. Okay, so it's like that client ongoing nurturing and making sure they take advantage of, of what they're buying from you. Uh, it, it sounds like you're doing a lot of different things, like being a, the media, I'm on the podcast talking guy, then you're helping with the hiring. I have no doubt you're, you're making key decisions on, on who to bring into the team. And then it sounds like you're working with established clients to make sure they see and, and extract the value from you know what they're buying from you. So that doesn't quite different, very interconnected uh, roles, but um, very holistic too. It gives you a good sense of the front end, the middle and the back end uh, of your company. So uh, that's interesting. Um, you know, Keysan, just to kind of wrap it up, where, where are we going with this business? It's kind of funny to talk to a merger and acquisition guy and not talk about one day selling your own company. Is that sort of something you thought about um, or, or the other side of the fence buying other companies to bring in to your, your own organization to expand that yeah, way? There, I mean, all those are ideas that are there that become more and more interesting to actually pursue. I think we're in a unique spot because today we're still out. We don't have any outside shareholders. So we're still tightly held company, private. Um, and I think there's a unique opportunity because I, I leverage it in terms of, hey, this gives us much greater focus on the customer we don't weigh our decision. We don't have a board and shareholders that influence our decisions. It's focused on the customer, um, and I'm, I'm I'm interested in in seeing how the, our our structure can evolve uh, to build the equity model to incentivize the team in the company, and be able to continue growing with them in that same capacity. And then, um, so I, I I think we still got a long view on this stuff. I'm I'm old, but not that old. I got at least another mm-hmm. 10, 20 years to run at this. Uh, and and I've, I've seen that before, you are. I don't know if you ever talked to other founders about it, but if you look at like this business life cycle, everybody's so fixated on getting up within this like zero to five year window and getting a big exit or IPO or, or whatever. But then when you look at the real reality, these the real big successes didn't blow up that fast. I mean, granted, there's so many Ubers out there, but when you look at a general, uh, you know, the, the median of these organizations, we're talking about like a 20 year, you know, to really see that big success. And if you look at these venture capital funding models, I mean, a lot of these founders are pushed to exit year 10 and then velocity really kicks in. You see massive amounts of growth that happens from year 10 to 20 and -hmm. they're on the sideline or working on the next venture, looking back at all that growth happening, you know, that little, you know, damn, that could have been, could have been part of that ride. Um, that's the one thing I noticed, you know, we we're hitting about 10 years and we had a lot of these struggles because of the industry thought, Hey, we built the technology too early and whatnot. Um, so I, I think we're, we're hanging on and we're starting to see that things are really aligning and getting some more tailwind. Uh, you know, we want to really keep building off of it. And then I, I think the industry itself is now starting to shift in our favor where we're finally realizing we shouldn't be doing billion dollar deals in Excel. Uh, but the now there's like here's all this emerging AI stuff. You, you know, if you look at all the trend with GPT three and things like that, it's like well, a lot of this stuff applies really well to M and A. We can build some cool tools to summarize information and get the information you need quickly when you have massive, massive amounts of data you're trying to analyze on a complex deal to understand the risk and the opportunities in it. So I think there's just tons and tons of opportunities to keep 
improving and driving optimization when it comes to M&A? I do have a question actually regarding pricing models. Um, it just come, came to me with the nature of what you guys do. Um, I'm looking at it right now. Your, your sort of starting point is a thousand dollars per month billed annually. So it's, you know, like a, a, a $12,000 kind of setup. Um, I, I think about though, the, the actual M and a process, it, it doesn't lend itself. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong to, we're going to need this for 10 years, unless we're actually a M and a M&A firm that cons or a bank, maybe that constantly does refinancing. But if I'm just one, like if, if I'm the person selling my company, I'm probably going to sell one company every 10 years at yep. most. Uh, so it, is it your customer base more like the, the M and a firms and banks, and, and then they just bring in the person who's selling the company for the purposes of that one deal, but then that person exits. Is that kind of the typical? We, we do have scenario? a good portion of our business that come from banks or even directly from the client that are selling. And that's where we have those listed prices as single room. I mean, we're trying to build uh-huh. a workflow to let them just sign up on their own because there's not a lot to it. We can essentially provide templates and the workflows for them to do it themselves. Yeah. Our outbound efforts, when we think of enterprise sales, is geared towards corporations and we put them in three buckets. You have Occasional acquires, they might buy zero to one company a year. Or, and then you have uh, frequent acquires that they may buy a regular two to 10 companies a year. And then you have serial acquires, which you can think of the, the Apple and the Googles, Microsoft, Cisco. Um, and when we look at that, that's where we look at our space. Typically, it's the frequent acquires. They're one to 10 billion market cap companies that do three or more deals a year that have a dedicated corporate development team, about three to seven people that drive the M&A activity for the organization. That's our prime target. And then in addition to that, our private equity-backed roll-ups. There's a lot of uh, investments made in organizations to roll-up industries. Think of specialized clinics, dental practices. We have a big auto body shop, private schools, security agencies, a lot of those fragmented industries that are getting rolled up, those are great clients for us. We love talking to them because to be able to really build workflows that are rinse and repeat when their acquisition strategy is very much similar, it's a great opportunity to create value. Hmm. Okay, that that helps me get my head around your, your, your target audience and your pricing model. Now that I think about it, yeah, one, one big organization could be acquiring 20 companies a year. You don't necessarily hear about them all. It's it's funny mm-hmm. because of doing this podcast. I'm always on TechCrunch, and I'm like, this company acquired by Facebook, and it, it wasn't ever a big deal, but it was. It's there on TechCrunch, and you realize that's actually happening every day, really, and multiple times a day if you look at, across the industry. So I can see, especially if the prior the prior way of doing things was like Excel sheets and things like that, you really are uh, just naturally digitizing uh, the workflow of, of an industry that probably didn't have it until you guys came along right so i can see the need um yeah really nice uh anything else you want to throw in uh, kisan before we we wrap up the interview i i think we we touched on a lot of stuff i i kind of mentioned our our goal is one get more exposure to the the industry because i think there's a lot of roles in m&a beyond investment banking so i always encourage folks to look at the website content and get a sense of that and then just the people at the end of the day, you know, M&A has got to change and be more focused about the actual people it impacts. And uh, when you align around the people, you'll result in a lot more value that's created from these transactions. And where do we find you? Uh, obviously dealroom.net for the, the platform itself and mascience.com for the education, the media arm, the podcast, anywhere else you want to send people to LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn, just K I S O N Patel. And, um, I'm happy to connect with folks on there. Okay. And I'm, I'm guessing anyone who's in M and a, or maybe even someone who's thinking of selling a large company would you would you be open to hearing from them? Does that make sense? I can or? talk about M&A nonstop. I don't have a problem. <laughs> I'll hit the record button. We'll make a podcast out of it. And uh, nice. um, I'm happy. I love talking shop. I'm, I'm welcome the opportunity to get involved, answer questions. We host a lot of roundtable events, summits, things of that sort. So, um, yeah, absolutely happy okay. talking about all things M&A. All right. Well, the next time I'm selling my company, I will definitely remember your name, Keith so <laughs> Just for the case of having a conversation. Have you gone through it before, the sale process? Only for small website businesses, you know, um, never 
like something where the diligence has been extensive and, you know, yes. yeah, I, I know it's, um, it can be stressful, but I totally understand the need for, uh, I, you know, as a minimum broker or ideally like a full blown, you know, firm managing things. So, yeah. Yeah. I'll, we'll be ready for you. We'll have plenty, okay. plenty of resources to help you out. Awesome. Well, nice to, nice to talk to you, Kisan. Keep up the good work. Okay. Thank you.